thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, I ask that you would be in our midst, that you would anoint your word as it goes forth. God, that you would challenge and equip us, that we might be pleasing children in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 5. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Why do you think that is? I'm being facetious. Don't you love the genealogies? How many of you just study the genealogies? You read them? You know, it's amazing to me when uh, I lead someone to the Lord and they want to start in Matthew chapter 1. I'm like, please don't start there. Please don't start at Matthew chapter 1 because really, what are they going to read? Hey, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. It's like, really? It's like, Lord, can't you just say, hey, they had a whole bunch of people in their lineage and it all led to Jesus Christ. But I really believe that there's a verse that would indicate that genealogies are important. But there's also a verse that says, you know what, maybe they're not too important. Genesis, well, and before we go there, turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. And this will give me every justification to skip the genealogies this morning. Some of you are saying, Amen. Some of you are saying, What do you mean? 1 Timothy, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia. Remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and what? Endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. I believe Paul here has given us justification to skip every genealogy that we come across. Especially the ones we can't pronounce. But verse 5, he goes on. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Do you have that this morning? Do you have a clear conscience before God? If you do, I can assure you this. You are striving to live a life pleasing to God. You have crucified your flesh. You're no longer practicing sin. You may fall into sin, but you're not practicing it. But if you're practicing sin, your conscience bothers you, and the hand of heaven constantly is saying, repent and get right with the Holy God. What you're doing is not right. I really believe today we're going to talk about, in Genesis chapter 5, a man called Enoch. And Enoch was the first man where it says he walked with God. Pastor Chris next week is going to preach an incredible message on focusing on Enoch and walking with God. But I can assure you this, even though Paul wrote to Timothy, don't be concerned about endless genealogies and speculations and myths. They are important. Turn back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 5. 5 was going to give the message a title today, it would be Finding God's Message in the Mundane. You ever feel like your life is just mediocre, mundane, the same thing, day in and day out, you just go through the motions of the same exact thing every day, it's mundane, but I can assure you that God wants to speak and break through the monotony of your life and make it something miraculous. So many times the enemy will say, you're just caught in red. The same old thing, day in and day out. And your joy is robbed. Your peace from God is robbed. But the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, He is our victory. He did overcome. And I can assure you, He wants to bring His miraculous power into your life and demonstrate His love to you in a powerful way. Genesis chapter 5, we have a genealogy. But I believe there's an important message recorded in the genealogy itself, and we're going to get to that. Some of you know what I'm referring to. It's kind of like Missler's uh, idea where he takes the names. Okay, now, I don't necessarily agree with Missler, 
But when we go to Luke chapter 3 and we do the names in the, in the Greek rather than the Hebrew, we get a powerful message. I think there's uh, possibly a hidden message in there for us. We're going to follow Jesus one step at a time. Are you doing that? Mark Greco got a word our last koinonia. By the way, tonight is koinonia, 5 o'clock at the Water District building. But well, like it was followed. All week I've been thinking about that because I really believe the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to follow Him. You know, you're following somebody. It's either the devil or it's the Lord. And I can assure you the devil's path is wide and it seems right, but there is a way that seems right unto a man and that way is the way of destruction. But following Christ, the path is narrow. Few there are that find it. You need a lamp because it's dark and the Word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. This morning we're going to get into the genealogy. Uh, I believe the verse that indicates there's something important in that is on the screen right there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, that includes the genealogy, right? Is what? Inspired by God. God wrote this book through 40 scribes. Do not let anyone tell you that the Word of God is made up by men. They just wrote it on their own whims and uh, whimsy and, and made up this whole thing. Every other religion in the world is made up, I can assure you. Paul said, whether we are an angel of light, appear to you and bring you a gospel other than that which has been taught. He is to be accursed. I've studied world religions. I have a degree in it, one of them. I've studied this book with a critical eye. This is the only holy book in the world that stands the test of time and trial. This is the Word of God. God inspired this through 40 men, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. That includes the genealogies. Oh, Lord, not the genealogies. <laughs> Let me ask you this. If I asked you right now, this morning, to tell me your great, 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 great grandpa's name, can you do it? How about your great, great grandpa? Yeah. You see, we have lost the whole importance of roots and family and genealogies. And some people try to get that back. And they'll research and, well, my great, great, great grandpa. And I had an uncle that did that. Hey, found out my great, great, great grandpa was a merchant seaman from Norway. His ship went down off the Sea of Biscay in France. He caught pneumonia and he went back and died in, in Norway after catching that. But how cool is that? He even found a picture of him. But most of us don't know our genealogy. We don't know our history. In fact, we live in the youngest nation in the world. One of them, America. We don't have roots. We don't have anything that we can really found our life on. The only thing for me that I have is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, they had to know their genealogies. Why is that? To be a priest, you had to prove that you were from the tribe of Levi. You had to prove that through your genealogy. And Christ's genealogy is given to us. They can be born, but God's message is in there. There is a message in the midst of the mundane monotony of genealogies, and there's powerful stuff in Genesis chapter 5. And this morning, we're going to look at that. By the way, I need to address this, and I'm only going to address it briefly. Uh, people take the genealogies of Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 11, and they try to establish the age of the earth. How they do that is simple. They take the ages of the men, they calculate it from when Adam was created all the way to the flood, all the way to Abram, or Abraham. And they figure that the earth is about what? 4,400 B.C., which would bring it to what? 6,000 maybe 16, 17 years right now. Okay, that could be the case. It could be there were genealogies skipped, like in Matthew 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, they skip three gener generations. There could be gaps in the genealogical record. There could be, but ultimately it does establish that this lineage is pure. Does that make sense? Now, I want to say this, that when you study the history of the world, and you study uh, all the genealogical records that we have in Assyrian records and Egyptian records and all of this, there are ways to make them completely line up with that young earth uh, genealogy that we come with just a straight reading of Scripture. You can make it line up. But I think there's about, give or take, 5,000 years, actually you have to give, not take, uh, in, in the record that we could come up with literally about 22 generations that could have been skipped. And all I want to say is this. There are those that you know, hold to a literal uh, geneal genealogical record, and the earth literally is 6,000, uh, about 17 years old. I, I agree with that. God could make that happen. But I don't make it dogma. Does that make sense? Okay. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on dating the world through the genealogies. Only God knows when he created the heavens and the earth. The angels were there, but no one else was. We simply do not know as a point of fact it's only this old. But I tend to go by this. By the way, most evangelical scholars go by this. It all comes from Unger's a genealogical account of the genealogies and dating the earth. And uh, most people say that this is the age of the earth right there. Those are the dates, and this is what we're going to go by. However, for me personally, I have no problem adding 6,000 years to those dates, and instead of uh, 4,004 BC, making it 10,004 BC when the earth was actually created. I have no problem doing that. Does that make sense? Okay. Is it important? It could be, but not really. The importance here is that Jesus Christ descended from Adam and it was a pure line. The Messiah had to do that, and that's the important thing in the genealogies here. All right. So, by the way, Jews right now, they believe we're in year what? Today, 5,772. They think that's the year that we are in from creation. Most evangelical scholars going by these dates, which the genealogical record tends to support, believe we're 6,017 years since the day the earth was created. I tend to think we could be actually 10,000 17 years since the day the earth was created. Why do I think that? Well, when you take the Ice Age, the Egyptian chronological record, everything else, it all seems to line up there. So it could be. But we're going to go with this because if we take the literal genealogical record, that's what it is. And I love that sticker uh, uh, Lindsay bought and Cody put it on his car and he is greater than I. You know, have you seen that? Some people think it says Heidi. They just didn't know how to spell. <laughs> he is greater than I. We are confident that that is true. All right. So Adam's tree. We have Adam. We have Cain and Abel. From Cain, we have Enoch. Not the Enoch we're going to talk about today. And Erid and Mahushudah and Methuselah. Not Methuselah, but Methuselah. Then Lamech and Jebel, Jubal, Tubal, Cain, uh, Nama, which is a female. And uh, by the way, Cain's line all died out. We know that, right? In the flood. Not one was left. But Seth's line became the godly line. We see Jared. After Jared on the right, we see Enoch. And that's the Enoch we're going to talk about today a little bit. Methuselah. What do we know about Methuselah? Oldest man that ever lived. Now, here's the thing about Methuselah. I believe God prolonged his life because he said, on his death, judgment will come. Basically, that's kind of what his name means. And God prolonged his life, hoping there would be repentance in that world, but they didn't repent. 
And right the year Methuselah died, the flood came and wiped everybody out except Noah and his kids. Genesis chapter 5. Let's get into the text. Oh, before we do, i got to point this out. Here's what's really cool. All right. This is from the uh, uh, Inductive Study Bible. You know, if you get those, it's like a study Bible thing. And it's uh, one of the pages in that Bible. But notice this. It shows the length of their lives and how their lives overlapped. Now, here's what's really interesting. When you look at Methuselah and Shem, Shem, the son of Noah, who made it through the flood, spent a lot of time with Methuselah. Guess who Methuselah spent a lot of time with? Adam. So we have Adam passing down to Methuselah everything that occurred after the creation of man. In the garden, the fall, everything. Adam gave it to him firsthand. We have Methuselah giving it to Shem firsthand. Shem survived the flood. Everybody else was wiped out, but Shem had this awesome oral history passed down from literally Methuselah who got it from Adam. Are you with me? So it wasn't long enough for myth to be, it, it would be like what your grandpa told you was myth about your family. Well, we came to America from Norway. Well, it's not myth. My grandpa told me. Okay, so it's very close to the original source. And now here's the cool thing. Shem talked directly to Abraham and Isaac. Wow. So Abraham and Isaac got the, the real skinny, the oral history of, of their people from just a, a couple of generations. Not long enough to be myth. Uh, folks, we can be assured of what was passed down orally. Does that make sense? I believe that's another interesting thing about the genealogies. So Genesis chapter 5, let's get in. We're going to dive in. And this is going to be an amazing journey today. I almost skipped it though. You know, that, that, that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we could, or chapter 1, we could have skipped it. Genesis chapter 5. Verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Really interesting to me because go back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. It says this, and this is the generations, or literally here my uh, version interprets it, account of the heavens and the earth. It's the same word in the Hebrew. Do the heavens and the earth have generations? Because that word in the Hebrew, Genesis 2, 4, this is the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord your God made the heaven and the earth. Now we go back to Genesis 5. It says, and this is the book of the generations or the account, same word, of Adam in the day which God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. That's pretty amazing. That even the heavens and the earth, there's indicated in the Hebrew some generational kind of progression. Now, I don't believe in theistic evolution. But I can tell you this, could have God built generations and age into the earth? The day he created it? Absolutely. And I believe that's probably what occurred. Here we need to observe in chapter 5, verse 1, that God made us in his likeness. Note this, go down to chapter 5, verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, same exact word used for us being made in God's likeness. That's when we talked about we're probably made in God's physical image. That's why in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, we are special. So when the Bible says God is seated on the throne and the scrolls in his right hand, you can bet 
the prophet saw him. They recorded it. He has white hair. He has bronze skin. And he's seated on the throne. And Jesus Christ is seated on the throne to the right of his hand. That's what the Bible describes God as being. Who are we to discount that? Especially since we're made in His image. We talked about that in depth. It's physical image. It's not, well, we have the ability to create. It's not talking about uh, emotional or intellectual image or even characteristics. It's talking about literally the word means an exact physical representation. That's what the word means in the Hebrew. Continue on verse 2. He created them male and female and blessed them. How long after Adam was created was Eve created? Remember we speculated. Adam had to name all the animals. He did not create them the same day, but in this account you would almost get that from the text. The day he created them, male and female, but it wasn't one day. That's why I do not believe we can be dogmatic on the age of the earth because it wasn't one day God created Adam and Eve. In fact, Adam was alone in the garden. He named all the animals. We speculated that would have taken, what, 40 years? Adam was alone, and God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I need to make for him a what? Helper, but the word literally means what? Protector. Ladies, you protect your men. Do you know that? Well, I thought the man protected the woman. Yeah, physically, but emotionally and spiritually, you are the helper, literally the protector. It's a word used mainly about God the Father and His kids. God is our helper. From whence does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. He's my protector. My, he guards my emotional state. And we talked about that. She was created long after that, not the same day, even though it indicates that it was the same day in chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years. Interesting term, the word lived there in the Hebrew. Literally, it means came to life, was sustained in life. And we find that word used over and over for someone who died and rose again in the Old Testament, the same word in the Hebrew is this word. Turn to Numbers chapter 14, verse 38. And let's just explore that a minute. Do you think Adam could have died the day he ate the fruit and then God brought him back to life immediately and that's what this is referring to? You see, God said the day you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. Do you think Adam and Eve could have died and instantaneously brought back to life and then sustained in life from God? Well, this word, let's go to Numbers 14, 38. By the way, did I dismiss the youth? <laughs> Lane, you reminded me. Do you want to take it out? Okay, sorry about that, guys. Oh, man, you, you got to stay in and listen to the old guy. You know, I don't know. Yeah, Numbers 14.38, But Joshua, the son of Mun, uh, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive out of those who went to spy out the land. Same word in the Hebrew. Remained alive. The other ones died. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 5. This gets even more interesting. Lane, I just thought about how boring I must be right now. And I thought, oh man, I forgot to dismiss the kids and you reminded me. They all got to listen to the boring old guy up here. So, young people, if I get too bored, just throw something at me. You know, I'll tell a joke, even though I can't tell jokes. 2 Kings 8.5 says this. And he was relating to the king how he had, what? Restored to life the one who was dead. Same word in the Hebrew. Same exact word. Turn to Numbers. Chapter 31, verse 15. 
I'm just making you turn all over in your Bibles. Namely, to cool it off in here. Let's really flip these pages. Numbers 31, 15. And Moses said to them, Have you spared, literally kept alive, all the women? So we have it used of people that were kept alive when they should have died. And we have the word used for someone who was dead and was brought back to life. So go back now to Genesis chapter 5. And there's more verses I could have went to, but I won't. Verse 3, it says, when Adam had, let's just do this, been kept alive. Or when Adam had been brought back to life. We could read either one of those ways. It's the same word in the Hebrew. 130 years. All this would do is say this. Those years were counted from the fall, not from the day God created Adam. Are you with me? So what that would mean is Adam could have been in the garden for who knows how long before the fall. And the, the, the years started to be counted the day they fell. Because that's when what came into being. Sin and death. Before that, they would have lived eternally. There would have been no death. So it makes sense, potentially, that it's counted from the day of the fall, not the day of creation. What that could do is add potentially even thousands of years to the age of the earth. So here's why I bring this up. Should someone have absolute proof someday that this earth is 15,000 years old. I could say, yeah, I, I, can, I can accept that. The Bible would say that's okay. Even if they had absolute proof that it was billions of years old, could Adam and Eve been in the garden for that long before the fall? Absolutely. You see, I'm not going to concern myself with that. I personally believe we're about 4,000 or 6,000 and 17 years old. That's what I believe. Worst case, I'll add some years to that. Maybe we're 10,000, 17 years old. But we're somewhere in there. All right, so let's continue. Wow, we made it to verse 3 of Genesis chapter 5. We're moving. Whew. And when Adam had lived or came to life 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Very interesting. Verse 4. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. And Seth lived 800 years, 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Kenan. Then Enosh lived 815 years after he became the father of Kenan, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Verse 12. Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. Then Kenan lived 840 years after he became the father of Mahalalel, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and became the boy. First Timothy chapter 1 right now. I'm starting to understand why Paul wrote endless genealogies. Oh. <sighs> Let's keep going. Jared. 18. So Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. Then Jared lived 800 years and became the father of Enoch and other sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God. Wow. Okay. I love that. Right? Why do people look so um, Before the flood, there was a canopy around the earth of, uh, of water. There was no rain. There was mist. 
Um, and this actually, scientists, we can actually uh, theorize this is how it actually was scientifically. There was this protective canopy of water so the harmful rays from the sun didn't come through. It was almost like a whole tropical paradise, the whole world. That's why it's very interesting. On the poles, they find palm trees buried in, in the, in the uh, ice. Have you heard about this? Okay, have anyone heard about that? I mean, literally, they found palm trees buried in the rice, in at ice at the poles, and, and tropical uh, vegetation. So there was a canopy of moisture, but it didn't rain. No, it was mist and, uh, and, and all of that. So theoretically, back then, plus we were genetically pure. Yeah. So God, back then, our gene pool was completely pure. And so man, you know, God really made man to live for a long, long time. He sinned, so the decay process began, and man has been de-evolving since then. That is, until medicine, now we're starting to bring that curve back up with medicine and, you know, surgeries and things like that. But it was also after the flood, the atmosphere uh, changed. Yes, yeah, so after the flood, all that canopy of water came down, flooded the earth, then went into the aquifer and uh, oceans and all of that. That protective layer was gone. Uh, actually, that's when the Ice Age came that we all read about. And it literally came after the flood of Noah. And there was a, a Ice Age. We got the polar caps. And uh, the ages of men from that time on decreased. We have the, uh, uh, oh boy, we're going to talk about it next week. But the king's list before the flood, and this is a secular document we found on a stone. Uh, with the, the list of kings from, uh, I think it's Syrian. But anyway, they lived long times like this, and then after the flood, short reigns. So even extra biblical documentation supports that. And next week, we're going to get into the flood. It's going to be an amazing study. Yeah. So, uh, can't wait for that. Let's just do it this way. <laughs> okay. What do we got? Okay, we got. 10 minutes. We're, we're doing good. The Bible only literally talks about two men that literally walked with God. Enoch and Noah. But there were other men that walked with God, but it's not necessarily stated in those words. Does that make sense? Can you imagine Adam and Eve walking with God? Turn back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 8. Adam and Eve had just sinned. They had tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. They were hiding because... The cool of the day was there, and it was the time that God himself would come and walk with them in the garden. Do you know that God created us for fellowship with him? He didn't create us to kind of just sit back and watch the drama of life unfold. He created us to run to him with our problems. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. He created us to have an intimate relationship with Him. To experience His power in our lives. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It says this, Genesis 3.8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife did what? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. And folks, as I studied for today's message, the Lord kept telling me that there are people, His children, that hide themselves from God. There's people in this room that are hiding themselves from God. You may be saying, what do you mean, Pastor? What, what do you mean by that? Well, you could be practicing sin, so... You don't want to enter into the presence of God because the conviction of the Holy Spirit would be too strong. 
But there's others in the busyness of your life, you've essentially shut God out of your life, and he desires to walk with you in the cool of the day, and you no longer spend time with him. Your prayer life consists of this. Thanks for the food, Lord. Bless to him. our bodies. Give us health. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the extent of your prayer life. If that's you this morning, the Lord is desiring intimacy with you. He wants you to engage Him in prayer. He desires you to be like Enoch and Noah, men who walked with Him. Did they literally walk with God? I don't know, possibly. But I do know this, I have had seasons in my life where I walked with God. I, I know, I felt His presence so strong everywhere I went, I knew I was walking with God. That's what He desires from each and every one of us. To be in a relationship with Him that's so close that we feel like He's right there with us every step of our, our day. That we walk with Him. Just like kids, we're like, oh, Lord, thank you. And the good things happen, we're like, oh, God, that was such a blessing. Bad things happen, we immediately say, Lord, I need your help. Where he's walking with us, it becomes who we are, part of our lifestyle, praying to a holy God and including him in our lives. Adam and Eve hid themselves. I believe many Christians today are doing just that. But Enoch and Noah walked with God. God wants us to do that today, this morning. Verse 25, Methuselah lived 100, and uh, back to uh, Genesis 5. I'm sorry, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God did what? Took him. Really interesting. He was the first man to be raptured. You know, we're going to be raptured like Enoch was when Christ comes back. But God literally took Enoch up into heaven. Who else was raptured like that? Elijah. Elijah. And here's one that you might want to study, but Moses. You know, he died, but then Michael had to come get his body because the only reason God resurrected him. And those two witnesses... In the 70th week of Daniel, I believe it could be Elijah and Moses because they do the things that they did and Elijah represents the spirit of prophecy and power and Moses represents the law. Some people say Enoch, but we don't know a lot about Enoch. Could be. We do know he walked with God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 really quick. Here's about all we know about Enoch. Actually, the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul. And Paul liked his coffee, so he named it Hebrews. <laughs> yeah, see? Hebrews 11 what? Hebrews 11, starting at uh, verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered up to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gift, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Verse 5. By faith... Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is something that I really didn't completely understand until Cody was born. And when Cody was born, as he grew, 
He, he had complete faith in Cheryl and myself. Those of you that are parents know exactly what I'm talking about. They're not concerned about anything. They're not worried about anything. All they know is mom and dad are going to take care of them. They have complete trust and complete faith. There's nothing they have to worry about except maybe what they're going to have for dessert. You know, <laughs> you know folks, faith is that childlike trust in a holy God. Knowing that he's got your back. He's going to take care of you. He's going to meet your every need and trusting Him in the midst of trial. Faith is knowing that God is going to hold you during the dark times. Enoch and Noah walked with God. Why? In the midst of a perverse generation that they lived in both. Both Enoch and Noah, the generation was horrible, sinful, they trusted God and walked with God. Folks, things are going to get darker than they are right now in this world. You look around, I look around, and I see Christians so-called. And it seems more and more lately, we talked about it this morning while, before we set up. And they say, you know what, the Bible is kind of a good book, but... A lot of myth, a lot of, it's been changed. You can't really trust it. You know, all we know for sure is, yeah, I believe in God and Jesus. And the rest of it, just kind of throw it out. Folks, we're approaching a very difficult time. In fact, Paul told Timothy, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self. Boastful, arrogant disobedient to parents, ungrateful. Boy, that kind of you owe it to me generation. You know what I'm talking about? Ungrateful. Unholy. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Folks, now more than ever, we need to be grounded in this book. You want to walk with God? Read his love letter to you. It's not a lamp unto our feet for no reason. This shows the way to eternal life. So it is that lamp, and we walk with God by being obedient to the instruction that He's given us in this book. The genealogies, let, let's finish it. We've got to do this quick. We've got four minutes. Back to Genesis 5. <coughs> Verse 25. Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech and he had other sons and daughters. So all the sons, all the days, excuse me, of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. By the way, the year he died, the flood came. And I'm going to show you what his name means pretty quick. It was really a prophetic his name. Verse 28, Lamech lived 182 years, became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground, which the Lord has cursed. Let me ask you this. Did Noah give everyone rest? Well, he says Noah is going to give us rest from the work and from the curse. The only rest Noah gave him was while he was on that cruise for about a year. Are you with me? So it was a true prophecy. Noah gave all mankind that was alive, just his sons and, and their wives, rest from the toil of working the ground while they were on a cruise for about a year. On that boat. That's how long they were on the boat. You know that. So they rested during that year. But who will ultimately give everybody rest? Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew 11 really quick. Keep your thumb here. Starting at verse 28. It says this. Come to me all who are weary. This is Jesus speaking. 
and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, there are days when I feel the pressure of life so strong. And the trials that people in this church are going through and people in other churches that call me because I'm the only pastor they can talk to for some reason. And I wonder about the burden of life and I feel heavy laden and burdened and God always brings me to this passage where Jesus this morning, if you're hiding from God like Adam and Eve did in the garden, Jesus is saying to you right now, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Aren't you glad? Hebrews chapter 4, you can read about it later, talks about entering the Sabbath rest in the Lord, which we all do. Back to the genealogy. We're almost done. <clears throat> so Noah didn't actually give them rest, even though his name means rest. But Jesus is a descendant of Noah. Part of his line through Shem. And Jesus did give everyone, including you and I, rest. Continue on, verse 30. Then Lamech lived 590 five years, and he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, next week we are going to get into chapter 6. Chapter 6, we're going to talk about the Nephilim. We're going to talk about the giants. We're going to see what the Bible says about the sons of God who came down and went into the daughters of men. I believe this is an incredible text, and we're going to lay the foundation for the flood and why the flood came. But now let's get into the meanings of these names in this genealogy. All right, from the Greek, uh, I'm not going to go with Missler and the Hebrew names because I really doubt how he came with some of the interpretations of the names in the Hebrew. Some of them are very clear, but the few names in the Hebrew, we have no idea what they mean. And Missler, I really believe, made it up. For example, I'm sorry, Chuck, if you're watching this, but for example, the name Lamech in the Hebrew, we have no idea what it means. And what he said, well, Lamech, even our own word in the English, lament, comes from that root word, Lamech. Well, it doesn't. Even though it sounds the same, I'm lamenting Lamech, but we have no epistemology of that word really meaning that. But in the Greek, we come up with a very cool coded message in the genealogy from Adam to Noah. And this is Christ's line. Adam means man from the red earth in the, in the, in the Greek. Uh, in the Hebrew, it simply means man. Seth means compensation in the Greek. In the Hebrew, it means appointed. Enosh means mortal man, same thing in the Hebrew. Canaan means fixed, lanced, or cut off. That's now that you got to get to the root word in the in the in the Greek of that. Mahalalel means the praise of God or glory of God. Jared means shall come down, literally to descend in the Greek. Same with the Hebrew, so it's close in the Hebrew. Enoch means dedicated. Ken means to instruction or teaching or even discipleship. The idea of discipling. Methuselah means when he dies, there shall be an omission. That's the Greek. Now what, you're going to find that in Thayer's. Potentially. If you have East Sword, it could be in the NASB's uh, Greek translation of it. Because it's different than Strong's. But it's like Strong's. Lamech means unto the low and questioning in the Greek. In the Hebrew, we have no idea what it means. And Noah means rest. You put it all together, 
And it's a very interesting statement. Here's what it means, the genealogy. The man from the earth will make compensation, paying a debt owed, by now being mortal. This is fixed. He is lanced or cut off, parenthetically, from God. The glory of God, Jesus, shall descend from heaven, dedicated to dying, and through his death there will be an omission, which literally means a declaration of light or truth. To the lowly and seeking of God, he will bring rest. That's awesome. The gospel message in the generations wow. is pretty amazing. Now, Missler does it a little different. He uses the Hebrew. Uh, I, and this is what Missler came up with. Uh, the God-man is appointed a mortal man of sorrow is born. The glory of God shall come down, instructing that his death shall bring those in the spirit comfort and rest. Almost the same kind of thing. Uh, but there's too much speculation in there. If you use the Greek, you get almost the same message. Uh, but actually we have fixed what these uh, words mean in Greek. So it's very interesting that the genealogy has the gospel message all the way back. <laughs> it's just great. I love that. Don't you love it? Yeah. All right, so next week, we're going to study the Nephilim, the sons of God. Who are they? Angels? Are they the descendants of Seth that went into the daughters of men and had these giants? And it's because of that that the seed was in danger of being corrupted and God had to wipe the earth out. Come on up, worship team. <clears throat> We're going to find out next week. Oh, the week after. Because next week, Pastor Chris is teaching on really walking with God and Enoch. And really, you know, that's going to be a great step. <sighs> During this closing song, uh, we kind of changed it around. Uh, the ushers will be gathering the tithe and offering during the closing song. If you need prayer, uh, the elders will be outside these doors to pray with you. And uh, God bless you. Thanks for coming to church this morning.